Kyle Klingman with Track Wrestling. We have a unique interview. We have three other people beside myself on the interview. We have Chris Ayers, who is the head wrestling coach at Princeton. We have Zach Tonelli, head wrestling coach at Columbia. And Jackie Davis, who is the ultimate promoter of women's wrestling. And we're excited about what we get to talk about because women's wrestling is a trend that continues to move forward. And it's a movement that continues to move forward. And Jackie, starting with you first, seems like there's some opportunities right now with women's wrestling that hasn't existed even within the last year. Where is women's wrestling and how do we continue this great momentum that we have for women's wrestling and the growth of women's wrestling? Uh, yeah, we're in an incredible place. Um, we're at nearly 30,000 girls across the country that are wrestling at the high school level. We have 87 colleges and growing that are offering women's wrestling. Um, each of these are kind of like scattered across different divisions and associations, which is really wonderful. Um, areas for growth is we only really have two D1 programs right now that offer women's wrestling. And that means that some girls are having to make the choice between their academics um, and the sport that they love. And so our, our goals right now, the area for growth is figuring out how we can close that gap. Closing that gap is part of this conversation. We have Zach Tonelli and Chris Ayers, as we mentioned on, but you've collaborated with these two coaches about ways to really get that division one game even higher. What's the vision for what the EIWA can do? Yeah, so we're, um, we're working on trying to educate and create awareness and visibility around around this, because I think unless you're in it, you don't really think about this concept of a, of a girl having to pick between education and, and athletics, um, or the girl that's losing the opportunity um, at an academic institution um, because there wasn't a varsity spot for her. Um, so what we're doing right now is we're trying to create a platform to educate um, the larger community, as well as help every single coach within the EIWA and, and D1 as a whole know how they can grow women's wrestling on their campus and help support the women that are already on their campus. Chris, you have a great backdrop there. I'm gonna let you explain what that is and what that means for you and how you can be part of the movement of getting wrestling in the EIWA. Yes, so again, it's creating awareness and, and educating uh, about the lack of opportunities, like Jackie said, in division one wrestling. And so these are just some social media outlets where people can get information about uh, some of the statistics that Jackie has or some of the, I mean, just to get the most up-to-date information on where we are in Division One wrestling. Again, we're not spokespeople for the EIWA or D1. We're just trying to um, get the information out there and just create awareness. And the thing of it is things are happening so quickly. Uh, I mean, just the past year, they added 10 10 states added a sanctioned state wrestling tournament. Uh, it, it's hard to believe where we were three years ago. I think the same thing is going to happen in D1 wrestling where we just can't be overwhelmed when it happens. I think we have to be prepared for the time when, you know, this snowball hits division one. And, and so this is an area where people can go to get their information. You have a daughter that's successful, Chloe, and she is a wrestler. How has this influenced your views of women's wrestling? It's interesting because when I talk to uh, just like the Princeton administrators and, and I, I always feel like it, it's not like I'm advocating for my daughter. It's what I've learned in relation to what my daughter has gone through in the wrestle, in, in wrestling. And I always say it, it was an incredible experience for me having her witnessing her uh, wrestle. And, and I don't know why I didn't see it before, but to see her get the same benefit from wrestling that I got was really eye-opening. And maybe before that, it was such a, I had such an immature view that I didn't even, I didn't even consider that, which is crazy. So really the benefit of wrestling for, for women is the same as men. And, and I just want them to have those opportunities. And, and again, like Jackie said, it, it's a tough thing to watch. My daughter's pretty high academically. It's pretty tough to have her watch. Like she, can, she doesn't have the opportunities that the men do at some of these higher level academic schools. So um, that whole experience has been, has been really phenomenal. Um, and again, it's not about me trying to pave a path for my daughter. It's sort of I've, what I've learned 
and now I, I've become really, really just really motivated to kind of help the cause and get it to where I think it needs to be and where it deserves to be. How did she approach you about wanting to wrestle? <laughs> well, she just started, it was pretty interesting. We approached her and this is terrible too. Just, I guess we weren't sending very good vibes in relation to her wrestling, but you know, she'd, she'd asked to come to my brother's practice. I mean, her brother's practice. And I didn't even pick up on that. She maybe wanted to wrestle. It's terrible. And she'd be like helping. And he was really little. He was like in kindergarten. She's like, yeah, I'll just do like, I'll help you with behavior and stuff like that. And then she started asking to come to the college kids practices. So now she's on the sidelines watching our practices, but this didn't happen very long. And then my wife and I sat at her like, hey, this kind of interesting. I think she wants to wrestle. So we sat her down and said, hey, do you want to wrestle? She's like, oh, yeah, I'd love to wrestle. We're like, well, why didn't you just ask us? She's like, I thought you didn't want me to. So it was like really like gut wrenching for me that I was sending the vibe that she shouldn't wrestle. And and then looking back, it's just uh, it's quite honestly telling the story is a little embarrassing for where I am right now, like trying to promote this thing. And, and uh and so it was a, it was a really, really neat experience. And I, and, and I have, uh, it's been, our relationship has grown so much because she is wrestling. Um, it's, it's been really, a really life-changing experience for us both, I think. Zach, if you would reflect on your personal journey in wrestling and how you viewed women's wrestling when it first came on the scene. Yeah, I think, I think, a lack of education right and i think that's a that's the main purpose of uh maybe this call is is to kind of talk about how we're trying to spread that right we're trying to educate people um i knew it existed i knew it was uh smaller not growing um quite at the same rate and i think what i've learned uh <laughs> the, the biggest thing i've learned is it it isn't it hadn't grown because there hadn't been opportunities right and it's this chicken or the egg type of thing and what we're learning is that Hey, like New Jersey is a great example. And, and look at uh, Chris's, Chris's daughter. Um, they sanction a state tournament. And, you know, Jackie knows the exact numbers, I'm sure. But, but enrollment and participation, I should say, skyrockets, right? And every state that, that has sanctioned women's wrestling at the high school level has had that, um, that same type of, of trajectory and growth. So um, I think, like, I talked to my guys about, uh, this all the time on, on our team and, uh, you know, about right and wrong. And, and there's a lot of ways to do the right thing. And there's a lot of ways to do the wrong thing. And I think at the end of the day, um, this is, this is more than right. This is the future of our sport from a men's uh, wrestling standpoint. Um, and there, there's just nothing, <clears throat> I guess, in, in my opinion, it's like, Chris is the head coach of Princeton and I'm the head coach of Columbia. Um, but those are they're temporary positions, right? Like we will not be there forever. This is sustainability for our sport and playing in a larger, um, a larger role. You know, that's the legacy we leave on. And um, I think that's kind of the role that I see ourselves put in now and where uh, I don't have a daughter wrestling. And uh, in fact, I'm going to be recruiting Chris's daughter to wrestle. And that's going to really be heartbreaking when, when Chloe, um, Ayers is at, uh, is at Columbia. It's going to be <laughs> devastating seeing her in Columbia blue instead of that, that orange. But, um, I think again, it's just, it's about education. It's, it's our role. It's our responsibility, um, to, to create a sustainable, um, environment athletically for these girls where they don't have to choose athletics or academics. Speak to the history of your program, one of the most tradition-rich programs in the country. And I think wrestling maybe relies on its history a little too much and looks in the past too much on we're the oldest sport, but we need to continue to look at ways to advance the sport. What would it be like for Columbia to make new history with a women's wrestling program? Yeah, I, I, uh, first I'll echo, and maybe I shouldn't, but I, I agree. I think one of, one of wrestling's biggest strengths is how almost stubborn and thick-headed we can be and we will get it done at all costs uh at the same time i feel like it's one of our biggest shortcomings right and the, the lack sometimes um or lack, like just in not as open to change perhaps that that we could potentially be um but i think it would be great you know we columbia specifically we are the oldest uh college wrestling program in the nation and 
Uh, we wanted to be the first women's Division One program. Um, it's a bummer that we're not. At the same time, we're really excited that some other Division One programs are starting. Um, our goal right now is to is to be the first Ivy League program started, and, and hopefully, it's a day before Princeton and Harvard and everything. But but uh, it means a lot, and it's actually funny. We're sitting on this call, and and Jackie's on this call. I took this job, you know, four years ago, four and a half years ago, whatever it may be. But the first person I met with, the first recruit was actually Bree Santos, who's now a, a senior. You know, I was literally my first day in the office and, uh, uh, and Jackie and Bree are sitting in my office waiting for me. So it's kind of, kind of wild how, um, in a sense, it's fallen onto my lap. There are a lot of things um, that I'm trying to settle into when I took this job, but, uh, but I'm really proud of the fact that, that we did have a, a female wrestler um, join our program. Um, and, that, and then that's kind of grown. So we have these foot soldiers, these, these four women now currently that, uh, that are part of our program um, directly and, and indirectly through our regional training center. But uh, yeah, I, I just think it's a really big deal. And, and with our history, I, I think it, it's a great tradition. It's a great history. We want to continue to add to that on the men's side and most certainly for the women as well. Jackie, talk about the value of identification and seeing other women in Division I programs and what that does for girls to know that this path is possible. That is such a good question. I am so glad you asked it. So I think of college as the same as high school. Uh, uh, and by that, I mean the barriers for girls to participate in college are basically the same as high school. So if it doesn't say girl anywhere, it doesn't say women anywhere, there isn't a picture of a female displayed next to a man doing it, they automatically think that they're not allowed to do it. And this goes back to kind of what Chris was talking about um, with his daughter, right? With Chloe, where she didn't know she was allowed to do it. And she thought just based on what she was seeing that she wasn't supposed to. Um, and so she didn't even think to ask. And so that's kind of what's happening right now at the college level. It's not, will women eventually go to these institutions? No, they're already there. We already have women at these institutions across the country. And we have for the past 30 years. We've had Patricia Miranda at Stanford. We had Afsun Johnson at UC Davis. We had Danielle Hobeka and Laurelie Summer at Harvard back in the 90s. And over the past 30 years, each decade, there's more women that are at these institutions. They just don't know that they're allowed to do it because it doesn't say so. So um, it's big to be able to advertise minimally, be able to say that women are welcome in the space. You're going to start seeing what Zach is talking about, this reverse engineering, right? If they know it exists, they'll come out for it. And like he said, to echo him, it's been proven in every single state that has sanctioned a championship. We have 29 states that have sanctioned championships for high school girls, each and every single one of them. The moment that they have it, their participation numbers start to skyrocket. So it's big. It's a really big deal. What kind of language should we use going forward? I know that we talk about women's wrestling. We talk about women's freestyle, men's freestyle, but should we get rid of those gender identifications? Should it just be wrestling? But does that detract from promoting women's wrestling so that they know that it's possible? Where are we in that space? I don't know if I've thought of that. I, I don't necessarily think that we should get rid of identifying that because I do think that there's value in having women's spaces um, in this sport. Um, I just think that for, for me, I was the first in my family to wrestle. Nobody before me had done it. And so um, I didn't even have the luxury of seeing the sport or knowing it existed until I was like 12, right? Which is much later than most people join. Um, and I think that's very similar to what's happening right now for girls is everybody that they've been raised by or that they're guided by in school, at home, they haven't seen women in these spaces. So they're just naturally not being pushed in that area or even knowing that it's an option. Um, but once they get there, I think there's benefit in it being a, co a combined space. Um, I also think there's benefit in having women's only spaces uh, because it's, uh, it's just different and it's nice to have um, the training style that is similar and benefits the strengths and flexibilities of a female body. 
Chris, what's your view on where athletic directors are right now in incorporating women's wrestling into the entire athletic platform? Is it something they know about? Is it something that you have to advocate for? Where are we on the timeline of that? They're just getting started. Uh, to be honest, they, I, and when I count, when I talk to any administrator about the numbers in relation to women's wrestling, they're, they're generally, they're generally pretty surprised. Um, you know, what, what, a couple of things that I've done is sort of look at the numbers in the Ivy league in terms of where's the participation in high school. And then what, what are the offerings in the Ivy league? And a great one is women's ice hockey, uh, where there's six Ivy league teams that's six ivy league schools that sponsor women's ice hockey uh their participation numbers were about 9500 in 2019 where in the nfhs numbers in 2019 jackie has the more current numbers uh there was 21,000 women so you know while and, and this isn't this isn't set of course this isn't saying that those teams shouldn't exist they should exist what i'm saying is there's there's a need for this in these schools uh, for women because it just continues to grow. And so uh, rugby is another one where there's three women's rugby uh, teams in the Ivy League. And meanwhile, there's about 678 participants in high school in the U.S. in 2019. Um, so, but the, the athletic directors don't know those numbers. They don't know that we added 10 states. And when, so that's, in my, my position, in my position, I want to educate them so they know these numbers and then they can make informed decisions because quite frankly, in the current climate, especially, man, it's, it's hard to add something uh, to, the, to athletics. Um, so they have, it has to be really compelling. There has to be a really good reason to do it. And I know just even talk with Zach, it's extremely hard in the Ivy League because these decisions go all the way up to the president. And so while you may even get an athletic, athletic director, you know, on board, um, then that has to go up to presence level. And so where we are, I uh, can't speak for the other Ivies, is we're just having conversations right now. Uh, I am just trying to, anyone who listen, I will tell them the story of what's going to happen down the road because Jackie, myself, and Zach, we kind of know how this story is going to end in relation to these programs are going to exist at some point. It's at what point do you want to adopt them? Do you want to be the early adopter and be the place where all the best girls want to come? I was talking to Pat Santora at Lehigh about this. And I said, man, the first team, you know, in the, EI, well, Sacred Heart had done it. So they're good. They're in a very good position, but maybe the first team in the Ivy, whoever starts it, like the best girls are going to go there. And he said, you know, it's funny at Maryland, uh, their field hockey program was the first to offer full rides, the full allotment of full rides. And guess what? They won the NCAA title the next seven years in a row, and they still win NCAA titles because they offered it. And the girl said, the best girl said, I'm going to take advantage of that. And now they're, they're one of the best programs in the country. So right now where we are is just education um, and just in, 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 in informing is where I think almost almost most athletic directors are who have advocates in their in their department there's coaches who aren't advocating either so we part of our role as as what we're trying to do is we're trying to get you know coaches who maybe aren't pushing for women's wrestling in the EIWA we want them to start having conversations with their ADs Zach, let's say hypothetical, you have a women's wrestling program. What would that look like for you? Would it change your duties? Would you want to oversee the entire program? How do you bring that in so that it's a seamless transition? Yeah, it's a great question. And uh, it's probably a little too early to, to, um, to decide that. I have spoken with our leadership, and I'm really, really fortunate to have such, uh, such great leadership here at Columbia helping me in this uh, charge of trying to, to get women's wrestling, uh, sponsored by, by Columbia. Um, are there, is there a separate coach? Um, so I thought I, I, I really, I go back and forth on it. Um, I think there's a, there's a lot of duties. There's a lot of responsibilities. I think one of the biggest, um, things now is, is, you know, folk style versus freestyle. Um, so I think there is a little bit of a, of a, um, style difference where, you know, the college men are, are training folk style and the college women are training freestyle. So I think, um, 
as it transgresses or uh, excuse me, as it, as it, you know, transforms, you know, maybe there is, there is this, uh, this program where there's a, there's a director or someone oversees both programs. Um, but I think initially we probably start with a, with a men's coach and a women's coach um, because of the styles. Chris, I'll go back to you. You had uh, one of your rival coaches saying he's going to recruit your daughter. How would you handle that? I would love it. Uh, honestly, if he's going to welcome her to a school like Columbia, um, it, it, it would be awesome. And I, and I would trust her in, in that environment. So uh, yeah, hopefully Zach, hopefully she does get in <laughs> and, and you can coach her. Uh, she's, she's a handful though. I'm just going to warn you right now. <laughs> she's a handful. But that is an exciting part when you think about it, Chris, that there are going to be these opportunities and hopefully there is a little, uh, little competition we've seen it with the the guys and there's some uh some offspring that have done well that's a good thing yeah yeah what's interesting too is i think uh, what i think the d1 coaches might be missing a little bit in my experience in helping get the state tournament in new jersey the amount of attention princeton wrestling program got was incredible so i just did this this little I did a little test with, with our Twitter, with Princeton Wrestling's Twitter. And so recently, uh, it's Princeton's 50th, 50th year celebration of, of adding women's, rest, uh, women's um, sports to the campus. So on, on or around that date, I just put out a tweet that said, hey, just want to let everyone know that the Princeton Wrestling coaches will support any women who are admitted to Princeton. Um, and we want to help them reach their goals or something along those lines. I knew the tweet was going to get a, a lot of traction. So we looked at sort of the analytics of it and there wasn't a tweet that we had at Princeton wrestling that got as much traction. I think that most one was probably back in like June. So most likes, most retweets from a simple little tweet uh, right now, sacred hearts getting a lot of attention and, and that's really good for it's great for the building, the women's program, but the side of that is it's going to help the men's program too. And here's the thing that's crazy. Like we've ignored the other half of humanity. And Zach got to this a little bit earlier about, you know, this is, this is good for wrestling, not just, not just men or women. You don't, you, when you add a woman to your program, you don't, you don't add, you know, one fan. You add her parents, her grandparents, her aunts, her uncles. And what's really neat is Wyoming SEM has an interesting culture where they've had women in their high school program uh, for quite a while. And if you go to those matches, the, the, the girls are cheering. They have their parents there, their friends there. It makes the environment so much better. So there's just so many good reason, reasons to add women's wrestling. I, I know I got off on a tangent there, but um, it's just – just something we, we really need to do for the sport. I believe it's the number one thing that has to be done to ensure the health of wrestling in the future. And, and as, Zach, as Zach alluded to it, like this is our legacy. If, uh, if we help to do this, I feel really good about my role in wrestling when I'm, when I'm a bit older. Jackie, I'm gonna let you have the final say. You have a Harvard shirt on. I'm gonna let you explain that Harvard shirt. And then any final thoughts you have on the potential of the EIWA bringing in Division One women's wrestling? Yeah, so um, we're at a really cool place. I'm wearing this Harvard shirt. My husband uh, went to Harvard, but um, before we moved to the Boston area, um, I was wearing a lot of Columbia stuff. Um, I think that I'm just a supporter of these institutions and having women in these spaces. Um, so I'm wearing this shirt, but like I said before, in uh, when I was in New York, I was running a, a, a girls and women's wrestling club out of the Columbia room um, on Sundays, every Sunday for like four years, um, hoping that getting girls in that space would allow them to know that they belonged there and allow them to know that it's possible. Um, and, you know, I ran a big tournament out of the Columbia kind of space, Gotham City Girls Open, hoping that nationally girls would be able to see like, oh my gosh, this is a beautiful institution. And hey, I've never thought about academically challenging myself this way, or maybe I'm already at that level and this is a place I could go. Um, so for, you know, eight years or so. It's been a lot of 
intentional things about putting women in these spaces so they know that they exist and that they're possible. Um, recently, the shift was uh, at Harvard. Uh, we moved to the Boston and New England area and I started doing the same thing, just running girls and women's wrestling practices weekly out of that space, two times a week out of that space, side by side. Um, at the very end of their college men's practice, we would come in and we would run our girls club practices. Um, and it was a regional thing, same concept. If we can get them in this space, um, maybe they'll know that it's possible, you know? Um, and lo and behold, we have two institutions, Columbia and Harvard, who have been approved for club status. So they have official women's wrestling clubs at their schools. Um, part of that is because just the visibility and knowing that it's possible. Um, but the other part is that when you do that, when you get these young women in who want to matriculate up, you also create this visibility for the women already on campus. And so Columbia is special and I'll let Zach talk about that. Harvard is a little bit different where the women that are all part of this club who have been like filed, worked hard, promoting, doing virtual practices weekly, only one of them has ever wrestled in her life before. The other 15 are girls who have never done it, but thought it would be really fun and are like down to fight for the cause. They wanna create a legacy. They wanna create the, the better pathway for the next generation of girl. And I'm honestly super impressed because each day that we meet, each virtual practice that we meet at, um, I'm watching them become wrestlers through a screen like this, through a Zoom practice like this. And where they started out, maybe not ex super excited about competing. Now they're like, oh, let's qualify for the national championship so I can put a Harvard singlet on and show the world that Harvard has women's wrestling. Um, so that's the Harvard, but I mean, I'll pass to Zach so he can talk about the women's club too. Yeah, real quick, because I, I know we are running out of time, but but building off what Jackie said, and then obviously what Chris said, Chris talked about that that tweet he put out and um, you know, so, so for anyone listening to this, right. And hopefully this is, this is, uh, received well by, by people all over the country, but you do have options. Princeton is an option for you. Columbia is an option for you. Um, and part of our job, uh, you know, Chris and myself is that education part. I think, you know, for us at Columbia, it's different than other schools, but for us, the first step in going and becoming a, a varsity sport is starting that club process. So figuring out as a head coach um, or just a, a woman that, that's at a school and how, how do you become varsity at that school? Um, for us, you can't do it without having club status first. Um, so again, we, you know, I, I did want to touch on that and, and making sure that, that everyone um, is aware of that and, and look, look into it because everyone, it, we know where this is going. Chris said it before, we know how this story ends. We want to be early adopters. That's, that's wrestling in a nutshell. We don't, um, we want to be first. That's it. We are hyper competitive, um, and, and not being, being second, uh, to the table here. But, um, I guess another thing I'd say is, is we do, we have four girls, um, you know, Chris talked about that Wyoming seminary program. We have some, some girls that were taken from there. And, uh, it's just amazing to have these, these women, I should say, um, training alongside us. Um, so they have opportunities here. They have the, the best of both worlds from an academic and, and athletic standpoint, the same they do at, at Princeton and hopefully all these other Ivy League schools that are on board. But um, we're going to continue to fight. Um, not fight is the, is the wrong word, but we're going to continue to do our, our uh, due diligence to make sure that other programs are, are as open to having women wrestling um, in our league, in our conference, and nationally as we possibly can.